Okay, now let's go to Revelation 7. And after these things, so after, the, after John saw those six seals, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. So John sees four angels standing on four corners of the earth. Now apparently atheists and scientists use this as a proof text that your Bible has errors. So notice right here that your Bible teaches that the earth is flat. And apparently, I'm really sorry for some flat earthers, some flat earthers take this as ode to joy that the Bible argued for a flat earth. Now, in my opinion, I've already said this online, but me, I hold to a, I don't say a yay or a nay concerning flat earth. You might say, why is that? Because when you look up online, it's endless, endless, man. Every time you might find a criticism against flat earth, there's always another video to respond to that. So then the videos are just so endless that you got to realize this, is that if I'm going to be fair on both sides of the argument, you're going to have to give me several weeks to study all of that and to look at all the verses. So I don't give a yay or a nay position on that one. And by the way, if you don't have doctrines in your life that you don't put on a shelf, that's very dangerous. I'd be scared if I were you. You're going to soon spit out something out of your mouth, some deep doctrine that you might be wrong about later on. That is very, very good advice. Now you notice how I can give you like really deep stuff, right? But you gotta realize this, all this deep stuff that I'm giving to you, this preacher should know as well how much is the limit here. And if I'm telling you that with all the deep crazy stuff that I showed you, if I'm warning you about putting doctrines on a shelf, you better take that to account. I'm already crazy enough with what the stuff that I teach online. And if you can't abide by that simple rule that I live by about d putting doctrines on a shelf, you're going to be in worse shape than me. <laughs> All right, so that's good advice. Okay, so concerning this fact, whether it be a flat earth or not, I'm not going to focus on that one. I'm just going to simply focus concerning the atheist point of view. There's a simple answer to this one. The four corners of the earth, you got to realize, is an idiomatic expression that's used in everyday life. You got to realize that there are people who, who talked about, for example, at 1950s and 70s, they would say, Marines are serving Uncle Sam in the four corners of the earth. What, what did that mean? Did that mean, oh, we all think the earth was flat at 1950s and 70s? No. What they meant by that was north, south, east, and west. That's the simple answer to that one. So that's what they refer to the four corners of the earth. That's just an idiomatic expression that's used. I would recommend a, a book. So I only recommended this book only in this video. So I don't know why I never recommended it before. It's a thick book by Bullinger. And it's, I forgot the title of the book, but it's called Idioms, Metaphors, Figures of Speech, etc. I would highly, highly recommend you to buy it. That is a must book on your bookshelf. Because remember, Bible believers, we believe in a literal approach of Scripture. But remember, I emphasize so much about what? A figurative metaphorical approach of Scripture as well. Why? Because Paul used that at the book of Galatians, and I showed you many times, right? I gave you like a 25-minute video just on the teaching of figurative and metaphorical expressions in the Bible. It's that important. If you don't think allegories and symbols and pictures are not important to God, then you better consider why Jesus spoke in parables. You got to realize this, is that if you have only a literal approach in the Bible, you will teach heresy. If you only have a figurative approach in the Bible, you will teach heresy. Yeah. You know what? The Bible contains many different rich approaches in Scripture. And I showed you some of that before, which is interesting. Revelation, there was a historical application, doctrinal application, and a spiritual application. You can also see devotional approaches. You can also see metaphorical approaches as well as literal approaches. The scripture is really rich, and it should be definitely taken into account to study and not just think, oh, I have one approach, so I'm a scholar. You don't know nothing, man. Yeah. That book, you're reading the mind of God. And when you read the mind of God, it's deep. Yep. If you think it's all about just rightly dividing, that's it. That's, you think that's only God's mindset. No wonder you become a dry cleaner or a hyper-dispensationalist mid-axe type of person.
Because all they think is right doctrine is as long as I divide. No, you think that, okay, does that mean then dividing has no limitations then? Is that what you're saying? So we can divide as much as we want and we'll never teach heresy? You really believe that? No, obviously everything has limitations. Right. See, they don't think of rightly dividing approach and a literal approach and a historical approach, figurative approach, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now that we established that fact, let's go back. So there are four angels standing north, south, east, and west. But notice right here, holding the what? Four winds of the earth. Why are they holding four winds? That the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. So it's as if God has all these winds ready to blow over the world, but the four angels are the ones that are preventing it from happening. Man. If this is let loose, think about tornadoes, hurricanes, and typhoons, and all that that could happen, right? right. Now look at verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east. Okay, so this angel comes from the east, having the seal of the living God. Huh, that's interesting. So there's this angel who comes from the east direction, holding a seal, God's seal. Why is that? Well, let's just continue reading. And he's cried with a loud voice to the four angels. He's telling these four angels to whom it was given to what? Hurt the earth and the sea. So notice that these four angels have these four winds that are going to hurt the earth and the sea. Wait a minute. So then when you hear about all these hurricane events that are happening, that means it might be a scary thing, right? Yeah, it's going to be a scary thing. So notice that these four angels, as they're covering north, south, east, and west over here. Okay, i got to draw really fast over here. So, As they're going north, south, east, and west over here, they're holding the four winds. When they're holding the four winds, it's about to cut loose on the earth, north, south, east, and west. Then the things that you're hearing about the hurricanes that are happening worldwide, that's something to pay attention to, that means. Because those things are just building up where those angels are holding it and they're about to let go. It's like they're dropping in little bits of wind and then a uh, hurricane here, a typhoon there. Why? Because they're letting loose a little bit of it. But once they let it go, you're not just going to see one hurricane story and the whole world moans about that and makes big headline news. You're going to see typhoons, hurricanes, tornadoes, everywhere around the world, and the news are just going to be flooded with that. That's what's going to happen at the tribulation. This is going to be pure, utter chaos, man. Pure, utter chaos. Now, what's very interesting is that there's a particular angel who comes out from the east, though. East. Why is he coming from the east? There's a, there's a tip right here. When the angel comes out from the east, the Bible says right here that he's holding a seal of the living God. Holding the seal of the living God for what? Verse 3. Saying, hurt not the earth, so don't hurt the earth, neither the sea, don't hurt the sea, nor the trees, don't hurt the trees. So these winds are going to hit earth, sea, and trees. See that? So you're going to see hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes, all this kind of stuff happening. It's going to be big. Till we have what? Sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Looks like that this angel is sealing. He is sealing the servants of God on their forehead. What are they? Verse 4, the Jews. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. Who are they that are sealed? And they were sealed and 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. All tribes of Israel who are 144,000 Jews. That's why he's coming from which direction again? Ah, that makes sense. That makes sense. They're about to let loose. But then this angel comes from the east saying, no, 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 until I finish sealing them. That's what's going on. All right, another heresy that you're going to hear, which is fantastical. You notice how these heresies are very fantastical. You notice that? 
Apparently, Jehovah Witnesses think that that's what verse 4 is talking about. It's them. Now, apparently, our weirdo friend from Arizona thinks that that could apply to himself, too. So this is just getting weirder and weirder. I think he may have changed his views on that one now. Why? Because he just looks dumb enough saying, I'm a 144,000 Jew. Because why? He sounds like a Jehovah Witness then after that. So notice that verse 4, this 144,000, that there's this weird group of people who claim, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew. And that's a heresy called replacement theology. Replacement theology believes that the Christian church has replaced the Jews. And so some of them, I'm not saying all, don't get angry again, all right, calm down. But some of them at verse 4, that's why they're going to claim that that's referring to themselves. Now that's just ridiculous because um, do you know how ridiculous that sounds? Look at verse 5. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. See, God is naming specific tribes here. This is referring to spiritual Jews. Okay, then who's spiritual Gad? And who's spiritual Judah? And who's spiritual Reuben? I could say that Brother Max here is from the tribe of Reuben. Sister Sheila is from the tribe of Judah. And because I don't like Brother Jack, he's going to come from the tribe of Dan. Okay? So you notice right here that <laughs> Dan is not mentioned in here, by the way, which I'll show later on, which is interesting. But anyway, so notice right here, the point is, the point is, you see how ridiculous that sounds? Then who's who from which tribe then? See, that's just utter nonsense. So this can't refer to spiritual Jews. This has to be a literal group from a literal individual, from a literal tribe, physical group of people. These are literal physical Jews. There's no doubt about that. Another thing is, what are you going to do with Revelation 14? Go to Revelation 14. There's this one female Jehovah Witness that, who thought that the Jehovah Witnesses were the 144,000. And then this evangelist just pulled up this verse on her. And then look how, how she felt about it. Look at verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So look at that. They're sealed with the father's name. Now, before I continue on, what's important to know about this mark is that this mark contains the name of the Father. Why is that important? Because it shows that Christians are a different sealing then. Ephesians 1.13, we're sealed by the what? Holy Ghost unto the day of redemption. Now, remember Revelation 2 and 3? I showed you some interesting spiritual applications there a christian has a what new name so when we're already saved by jesus christ we already have a new name up in heaven and that all happened at a spiritual process but notice right here this is something that's literally hap happening where they're going to stamp the seal of god on their forehead it shows that these people are not what christians right. they're very different right. their sealing is different why is that because there's going to be a name that the Antichrist will use that will physically put on their foreheads. And if you look at Revelation chapter 13, the Antichrist here, what he's going to do is that he's going to have the people receive a mark on their forehead and in their right hands. And when he puts it, the Bible says right there in Revelation 13, it's the mark that includes what? His name. And that's what? That's not spiritual. That's physical. That's literally happening. That's why God has to do something literal as well upon the Jews. And that, notice, is distinguished from Christians who are what? Spiritually sealed with our spiritual names and you name up in heaven. See, there's no doubt. You have to divide. You have to divide. It makes more sense when you do it that way. Okay, anyways, notice that if these are the 144,000, look who they are at verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Okay, how did that female Jehovah Witness feel about that? See, obviously she was in shock, so that doesn't apply to them. What do you mean? These are referring to virgin males. 144,000 Jewish virgin males. You might say, that's a huge number, Pastor. 
that shows, see, truly a restoration of the nation of Israel. See that? So there is, a, there is such a thing where it's going to be a huge restoration where a lot of Jews are going to be turning to their Messiah. Why? Because the church is gone. God's program is no longer with the church. God's program is going back to the Jews again. Why? Because so many Old Testament verses gave a promise, God promising that I'm going to restore you again. You will turn to me. Even though I forsook you, you're going to turn to me again, and I will restore you. See, replacement theology, they only concentrate verses where, the, where God says, I forsake you. But they forget the other verses that says, but you're going to turn back to me one day, and I will restore you. They can't deny those verses. Okay, let's go back to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 7, excuse me. Thank you. Revelation chapter 7. All right, so notice right here that in verse 3, the 144,000 have the seal of God in their foreheads, and that's going to match Ezekiel 9. Go to Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. Now, notice right here what God does with the Jews. He puts a mark. He puts a mark on their foreheads. Look at verse 3. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub. Now, notice is the glory of the God of who? Not the church, but who? Israel. See, it's focusing on Jews here. Whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of where? Jerusalem. See, this is a literal landmass location in Israel. This is not spiritual Jews. Are you kidding me, man? This is literal. And set a mark upon the what? Foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Remember Matthew 24, abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, which I showed you last week at Revelation. See, this makes sense. This is referring to the tribulation timeline where the Jews receive the sealing of God. Okay, let's go back to Revelation chapter 7. So you're going to have 144,000 Jews who have the seal of God on their foreheads. And we're going to have to close it right here. I was going to teach you something really interesting about verse 4 through 8. What you're going to notice at verses 4 through 8, it's 12 tribes of Israel, but, the, but there are two tribes missing because they're replaced by other two tribes, Dan and Ephraim. But we will cover that in our next teaching, which is going to be intensely interesting if you look at the tribes of Dan and Ephraim. Very, very interesting stuff.